Every life has a story, and every story is worth sharing. Your story, my story, and our story speak of victory and defeat, joy and sorrow, resilience and vulnerability. They are not just our story, they are Christ's story in us. They are Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Our church is on a holy corner. There are a number of churches around us, a couple of them quite larger churches, very well known in the city. And we are hidden behind in a small warehouse behind them. A lot of the times as we drive in uh, towards our little humble church at the back, we're almost guided into the first church. <laughs> and then if we make it past the first car park, we are guided towards the second church. And somehow we navigate to get uh, into our car park. But along this uh, beautiful stretch, there's some beautiful churches, some beautiful people, some beautiful leaders. Among them, it is uh, uh, Mark Lassie, who is our guest tonight from Kingdom City, uh, whom I've met at Kingdom City. I've come to, to visit their church, their beautiful church, and I know quite a few people that go there. And it's just a privilege now to have him on our show at Kingdom Stories from Down Under. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. It is a holy corner, isn't it? It is a busy corner on Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> so we've got CRC, we've yes. got you guys, of course. Yes. We've got Reality Church. Yeah. You've got us. What else? There's four of them. Yeah, but then then you've also got the uh, the Indians on the corner that Hindu make it temple. just a hive of activities on a Sunday. So it is... A, Do they come on Sunday as well? Sometimes? Yeah. On, and at certain times of the year, they'll have festivals. And so oh. it'll be four weeks of just pandemonium along this little corner. And you would have Gap. cut deals with all the neighbouring properties, trying we, to work it out. We've with tried to. Some of them last a little bit longer than others. But, yeah, um, yeah we, we try as best as we can to keep a good relationship with most of them. And you've got an amazing team. I mean, you guys are so well, uh, you know, regimented. You always have a lot of people in the car park doing the work, which is just fantastic. Yeah, well, I think we, we have to because we we really don't have that much space on our actual land. So we've got to have some type of coordinated effort to make sure that we've got young families yeah. getting closer to the church. I love that. Or people that, you know, have some type of... Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, just, we want to make sure that the people that need to get closest to the church get closest to the I love that because when I drive in with a family wagon, yes, uh, we have a little Tarago. Yeah. And uh, having four kids, we had to have a seven-seater. Yeah. And every time I drive in there on Sunday, I get priority. <laughs> they want to drive me at the front. I'm thinking <coughs> nobody can get a, a front uh, parking lot, yeah. but they want to drive in there. And I'm thinking, oh, I should go and park there just because they're yeah. so kind to me. You know? Yeah, we've had some people just adopt a child just to get closer, <laughs> just jump in. But That's good. We try to make sure that people, people that battle to get to church, particularly young families, yeah. you know, it's it's hard enough. I've been had young kids and, and you get to church, you want to make sure that it's as... It's also as dangerous as crossing roads oh, and going sure. between cars. So obviously yes. it's a lot safer to have yeah. them. And the weather, you know, in All winter, the rain. And, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. Were you at Kingdom City from the beginning? No, my story is quite a long story in that um, my parents became Christians when I was uh, very young, about three years of age. In Perth? In Perth, yeah. So you were born here? Yeah, no, no, I wasn't born here. I, I was actually born in Brisbane. Um, and then we came to Perth for a, a, a couple of years only, and that's when my parents um, encountered Jesus. But then we quickly moved to Melbourne. I grew up in Melbourne till I was 16, then to Adelaide from 16 to 36, and then from 36 onwards in Back Perth. Here. So I've, I've done the whole loop of Australia, so... Um, yeah, I, I so in Melbourne. What were your parents doing in Melbourne? So they they became Christians. They received the Lord here, and they yes. moved to Melbourne. Yeah, so we moved for for family reasons to Melbourne, but then um, my parents actually became ministers. In so Melbourne. we started a, a a small church in the southern suburbs of Melbourne, a place called Frankston. Yeah, and then there was a, a moment of time. Um, in the 90s where we were actually going to move to South Africa and start a church in Durban. Wow. Um, but it was right as F.W.D. Clerk and Nelson Mandela were handing over power, so it was very volatile and we just couldn't get visas to get in. So Thank in God. the end, um, instead of going to South Africa, we went to South Australia. Well, and, um, still South. 
Yeah, started a started a church in Glenelg, my family. On the beach, so beach to beach, Frankston Beach to yep. Glenelg Beach. That's it, and um, and we were there for about five years. Uh, eventually, I I found my wife in Adelaide, and and we got married at the ripe old age of nineteen. Both of you. Both of us were nineteen years of age, um, which is scary because I've got a twenty three and an eighteen year old now, and for me to think that they're yeah. about. To, or could get married. Is, well, she could um, have been married for four years. They or... could have been married uh, by by his age, uh, yeah. my oldest age. We were we were at least one kid and nearly nearly two kids down. So, yeah, it's just a different time, yeah. isn't it? Um, but it did keep you out of mischief, didn't it? I think what it did do is it kept me focused. Yeah, it kept me focused. Um, we were integral parts of church life at the time. We were in a in a small church. Um, and then at um, 25, we, we launched out, my wife and it was two sons at the time, and, and we actually did our own church plant in a, a South Australia. In a South Australia suburb called Paraka, mm-hmm. and, and pastored that for about five years before changing, um, handing, uh, handing it over and kind of amalgamating it with a church in uh, Adelaide called Influences Church. Um, big church. Nice. which is a big church and I became part of the team there and yeah so it's, it's been a, a really interesting journey of, of life and ministry and following Jesus and just so you were in the early 90s in Melbourne yeah early 90s in Melbourne yes so I used to go to Frankston Beach oh did you a few times yeah I lived in Richmond I lived right in town okay okay but I love the coast and yeah did a lot on the coast a lot of friends around Dandenong yeah so from Dandenong you would go to Frankston yeah well we lived just on Frankston Dandenong Road just, <laughs> there you yeah, go. But, yeah I lived in I lived in many places Laylor, Bandura Frankston Seaford St yeah. Albans all in Victoria so wow. got, got around a lot yeah so. I love Melbourne I uh spent uh the beautiful age between 15 and sort of 21 22 in Melbourne. oh okay yeah and living in Richmond, you know, I was part of the life, yeah, city yeah. life. Went to RMIT, finished Camberwell High School, and then went okay. to RMIT and used to walk to uni and back. And just, you know, being there, you yeah. know, was, was awesome. And then we moved to Perth or I moved to Perth. Yeah, Richmond's a great spot. Yeah. yeah, I've got some good friends. I've got... You, used to work on the, on the beach at La Marina. Oh, okay. In... Um, St Gilda. So almost every night I was in St Gilda, yeah. working at various restaurants and... Uh, yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Strange Great. life. Great. Very street smart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing much surprised you. You know, you had everything. You know, all all the you know all the prostitutes, all the pedophiles were there, all the drug addicts, right. everything. Man, that place. I mean, even on the back lane where the restaurants were, were you know, we'd find people sleeping next to trash cans. Yeah. Had to lock everything. You know, cars. It was wow. pretty shocking, but. That was the period. So Melbourne and then, uh, how was Melbourne for you? Yeah, Fun? I, I love Melbourne. I, yeah. I think every every Footy. person has a bit of a nostalgic attachment to where they grew up. And, sure. and really to this day, I kind of consider myself a, an honorary Victorian. Yeah. Like for football, um, yeah. you know, when it comes to state of origin and stuff like that, I would, I would follow, uh, follow Victoria. But funny enough, um, even though I was, I grew up in in Melbourne. I've, I've always gone for West Coast Eagles. Wow, so that's I was, interesting. I was always the odd one out at school, um, yeah. but I just started enjoying football. Eagles were quite a new team, so I thought, oh, they're new to football. I'm and you had been here for a little. Yeah, I I started here. My dad followed the West Coast, so it was just kind of one of those things that I thought, oh, I, I like I like the newness of. Of the teams. Did you play footy when you were? Kid? I love footy. Yeah. yeah, footy was my, it was my number one sport. Yep, yeah. played for for a couple of teams in Frankston and schools, and went down to a school called Flinders, right down in Tyab, which is right down the base of Mornington Peninsula. And yeah, I, I played football all my life. Awesome. Still do. Yeah. Masters. No, I I I, I played when I first moved to Perth. Yeah. Um. And I found that I'd play on Saturday and it'd take me to about Thursday to recover. To recover. Just in time for another Just, game. And I thought, nah, this is... I think um, the first game that I played, I got um, 
I got elbowed in the eye and came away with a, a massive black eye and then had to get up on Sunday and preach. It was a thought, sign. It was a definite thought, sign. It's not a great look when your pastor gets up there with a massive shine. <laughs> so I thought, ah, we'll leave it to the young guys. Did you go through a period where you backpedaled uh, in your teenage years or not so much? Yeah, I, it, it was a very brief period. God was really kind in that as I was finishing high school and starting that kind of just thought process of what do I do? I don't want to just do what my parents told me to do. Yeah. I want to have my own expression. I want to be my own person. Um, and so I just started for about six months near yeah. the end of high school, just kind of throwing a bit of caution to the wind. Now, I, I grew up in a, in a really legalistic kind of setting, um, no which is, TV, Which is not always bad. Yeah, which it wasn't bad in terms of protecting. Um, so we no TVs, no radios, uh, you know, like just just Welcome very conservative. Yeah, and I'm sure you, there, there's a lot of us out there that, you know, that's that's how people experience God yeah. and so they wanted to provide that for, for their kids. Um, yeah, I think that... The problem is you, you're taking the ability for the children to that grow up in it to develop their own convictions. It's like you need to do this because we told you to. Yeah. And so I started to kind of want to develop my own convictions, Yeah. which even trying to develop your own convictions um, and forming your own thoughts and processes and, and questions yeah. was just not done. Yeah. Um, and so I, I started that, but at the same time, the church that we're at, um, there was a, a nice young lady called Kelly, and I knew she came from a, a really rough background and was making, you know, God the, the centre of her world. And so I, I knew, look, if I was to to have a have a relationship with Kelly, I had to choose. And so that really was was my protection. Is yeah. Um, hey, if I want to be uh, in a relationship with Kelly, I'm going to have to kind of choose of my own volition which direction. So yeah, that was that was about it. And so that was the motivation. Yeah, a couple of years later, we were married. So was it was she hard to get? It was interesting because it was. I think we both kind of started liking each other. Now the. The good thing and the bad thing is in, in a small church, there's not many options. You can't hide. <laughs> so it's like we're about the same age, you like me, we like you, there's not much hiding. So I wouldn't say it was hard, but um, it was still, you know, well, it was still a bit of a dance, isn't yeah. it? It's like who's going to admit that they like each other first? And um, yeah, but it was. And how long did the courting go for? Yeah, probably about two and a half years. Okay. So yeah, we were. It was a fair dance. <clears throat> Yeah, it was a, it was a it's a reasonable dance. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't. And your parents, they they were okay with it. Or? Yeah, they they were happy. Um, I think my parents' dream was just to find somebody that loves Jesus, number yeah. one, and everything else is kind of secondary. So, what was your dad's strongest points? Um, um, my dad's strongest point was, like he was he was a driven person in that he really wanted he wanted people to encounter God. Mm -hmm. And he wanted them to to grow in their their understanding of who God was, um, and so he was passionate about it. He was passionate about discipleship. He was passionate about growing the church, mm -hmm. um, and he did a really good job in 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 protecting our family from a lot of things that we could have got distracted with. So. Yeah. I'm really, I look back now and, and all of us, there's six kids in our family. All of us are in, in ministry positions. Yeah. I've got a sister in Uganda as a missionary. Wow. I've got um, a brother who's a pastor in, in Kalgoorlie. My, um, another, my youngest brother worship leads on church on Sunday. My sister's an integral part of church. So we're, we're all part of ministry ministry yeah. and life and, and adding to, to the body of Christ. So I look back and, I mean, there's many things that you could point at as parents and go, oh, man, you could have done this better, this better. But the outcome is six kids that love God. And, and they're all ministry, so the and, impact is massive. Yeah. So it's beautiful that he didn't lose his kids as some pastors do. They win the church, but they lose their family. Yeah, that, that is a... Whereas 
really he never grew story. maybe a massive church yeah but he grew a healthy church yeah. and a healthy family yeah which is probably the greater balance of the two i think so i think if you looked back as an old person and go hey the sum total of my life is kids that love god yeah well, i think you'd you'd be pretty happy with that if that was the, the only thing that you were able to achieve. I think that legacy on its own is, hey, we've got Massive. kids that make heaven their home. Is he still ministering? Is he still... Uh... He does a bit um, in terms of guest speaking and doing stuff around the place. So he, he still loves preaching. That's his, you know, okay. I think that, that, that era of pastor just, they, they find a sense of, of value and they, they've got so much life experience. I'd love so to. Much to I'd, um, I'd love to get him on board one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. He'd love to do it. And your mum? What yeah. is she up to these days? Oh, my mum's all over the place. She, she's just she's a ball of energy in that she just loves to. Do you do take after her? Um, in in some ways, like she's she's a creative um, force. Force, yeah. So she. She doesn't like to be tied down. Every time you call her, she's she's at some craft group or something. <laughs> thinks she's um, uh, uh, rowing boats on the Swan River or up chopping down trees. She just she can't stand still. So she's yeah. she loves life and, and loves to be part of anything and everything. She, yeah, wow. she you know the the young kids say FOMO. My mum's got FOMO. She hates missing out on anything. <laughs> And as growing up, what do you what are you fond of her? What what are the memories that sort of uh, stay vivid and alive in you? Yeah, I think mum mum was was always entrepreneurial. So she always was trying. She was doing something, and she was great at roping us kids into doing it. So she had you know enthusiasm. Yeah, she had some type of business idea or plan. Or um, mum was very good at at bringing structure to our house. Uh-huh. Um, in a way that I've never seen before. Like by the time we got to school, we had the house, you know, we vacuum, lunches made, bathrooms clean. Wow. We <clears throat> we grew up and our, our routine was um, a bit of Bible reading and prayer at seven o'clock in the morning. We'd read a, a proverb every single day and have a bit of devotion and, and prayer time before we get into our chores. And I just, I, I look at the, the structure and the discipline of doing that for six kids and and man, that's a that's a feat in itself. So, but how powerful that is because those healthy habits. Yeah, I mean, they just you. Don't, we probably don't realize how much they did in you. Yeah, I I, mean, I think that's a, a huge part of of why us as kids are, are where we are. Is yeah. that the discipline and yeah resilience? The yeah. You know, and and I think as kids sometimes you don't appreciate it like no. most of the disciplines that you have. Mm. But um, as a, as a pastor and as a as as a preacher and as a teacher, there's there's many things that I, I learned from yeah. from those years. Beautiful. And um, where did you get married in in the in the church in the same church? Yeah, so my dad married us. Um, yeah, we we got married uh, in a, in a little church in in the, the the foothills of Adelaide. Beautiful on a Saturday. Handel? No, in um, I think it's uh, Bell, Bellevue Heights, which is just under Flagstaff Hill. Nice. So, yeah, it was it was a great great time. It was a great time. Um, I mean, the the thing I love and miss about being part of a, that small community church is just you know everybody yeah everybody knows yeah. you um you know the, like most things there's good things and bad things but the fact that you grew up with such a tight-knit community is is a great thing beautiful beautiful and then uh you moved to adelaide and started your own journey or yeah. you were in adelaide but the, you started a church in adelaide yeah Okay, so your dad's pastoring a church and you began a new ministry yourself with your wife. Uh, So what happened is we just got married. Um, My dad and my mum moved to Kalgoorlie to take a church over here. We stayed in that church and um, over the course of a few years, we ended up serving in in a local church there and worship led and become part of it and kind of did my apprenticeship as a, as a pastor there. Did you do studies as well in, in ministry? N- not in that in that denomination. It was okay. kind of a, a more of a hands-on. Um, I did my studies a bit later on, uh, went to uni, and then um, started my own church when I was 26. Okay. So what, what 
part what denomination were your parents part of? Oh, it's called the Potter's House. Okay, yeah. No, good. Okay. And then uh, when you started your own church, was it a Yeah, that was a Potter's House. Oh, that was a Potter's yeah, House. Yeah, so the, the Potter's House um has a real vision for discipleship and church yeah. planting. Yeah. So pretty much it, the, the the idea is they, they raise up men Leaders. and yeah. their wives and just say, Hey, let, we're gonna equip you for you know the next three or four years and, and then really and send you out and um, some sink, some swim. Yeah. Some some work and um, yeah, we, we I have a good friend, I don't know if you ever met him, Marius Chrisan. Yes, I know Marius. He in he f- he planted a church in East Street out of what is Yeah, in fact I think we got sent out at the same conference. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure when that was. It must have been 15 years ago. And this was a beach roll, right? Yeah. I was there. Oh, were you? I was there in church. I came. He was my 2IC. No way. Okay. He was he was going to take over the youth leadership of wow. my church. And yes. then he left and went yeah. to Boris House. Yeah. Which so I didn't he... mind in a sense because I knew his he was going to be limited in, okay. in the church. Yeah. Again, ethnic church. Yeah, yeah. A little bit legalistic. Yeah. Great church, but l- limiting for his potential yeah. and for our potential, the generation, the new generation's potential. Yeah. So then he went, got equipped at Potter's house yeah. and I know he was released, he went to Ipswich. Yeah. I actually visited him there as well okay. and encouraged him and build him up and Lydia, I know them, yeah, so. Yeah, so so we got launched into our ministry to start our church, it's the same with a, another guy called Chris Mearns. Okay. Um, who started at June Gallup, so. Wow, yeah, it's, it's a small world. It's a small world, <laughs> isn't it, yeah. Wonderful. And you were sent back to Adelaide. Yeah. So what would happen is on we would all come from all over the country and we'd end up at the, the Beach Borough Congregation yeah. where they would host the conference. And then on the Friday night, they would say, going into Ipswich, yeah. going into yeah. Paraka, Adelaide, Mark and Kelly Lassie. And so then we would start our journey. So. Wonderful. Yeah. All dressed up in suits and ties That's it. and yep. back in the days. Mate, we, 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 we looked like GWs. Yeah, yeah. We all did in Mormons. Sunday best. <laughs> yeah. But it worked. For that era, it actually worked. Yeah, it was good. And look, I think uh, to raise up leaders is wonderful. Yeah. For general lay people, probably a bit uh, too, too no. tight. Yeah. But uh, I think I, for leaders, wonderful. Yeah, and I think that's... Because you, you have the structure. You've got the and structure. And then you can embrace it keeps, the liberty. Yeah, and it keeps young men focused. Yeah. Um, and that's for a lot of well, young men. Well, there's a system, there's a path. Yeah, it, it's very goal-orientated. Yeah. Um, there's a sense of, hey, if you're a man, this is what you're called to do. We'll yeah. make the decisions, we'll send you off and get it done. Um, yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is from that era, I think I would be the only person still in the ministry. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, my Marius did come back. Yes. And uh, I have asked him to, to come and partner with us. Yeah. And he said, that I don't want to do ministry. I'm, yeah. I'm happy. Like, I'm going to, I think they're going to C3 in Jundalab, okay. if I'm not wrong, uh, in Hebben Heights, yeah. at, uh, where John Finkel used to be. Yeah. And, um, but he said, no, I'm, I'm going to the marketplace. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's over, doing very well from what I hear. Yeah, he runs a plumbing maintenance, yeah. a real plumbing maintenance business. In mm-hmm. fact, he services our factory as well. Oh, really? Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's doing really well. He was always, he was an entrepreneur. He's yeah. a hardworking young man. Again, he got married early. Um, we all did. Three children and uh, just, you know, thriving and wonderful, wonderful leader. Yeah. Massive potential, massive yeah. potential. Yeah. This is great. Well, what a what a generation, you know. Mm. Um, and so you're back in Adelaide now. You're planting a Potter's House church. Yeah, so, from zero. Yeah, from zero. I was literally uh, myself, my wife, two kids, um, and like we, we did fabulous. It, yeah, we did it hard. You know, we, there was no income, was there? No they, income. I, I had my own business at the time, so I was working a full time job. Um, what were you doing? I had a building company at the time, and then we we uh, went into franchises. Got had a Wendy's franchise, um, and so that was supplementing. So you you're a licensed builder, or you were doing carpentry work? Or? No, I was doing drafting, and then I had um, contractors doing building and stuff like that. Wonderful. So, yeah, I, and Wendy's ice cream. Yeah, Wendy's ice cream. So we had a franchise in one of the shopping centres. Nice. Um, and Good then, ministry platform. Yeah, it, I, I love the I love the duplicity of having having marketplace experience yeah. and 
And I did that for most of my ministry life. Yeah, um, same here. I'm still doing it now. Yeah, and so I, I love the the relatability of that. Um, and then I so we started and, and we'd set up every Sunday in a, in the university in Mawson Lakes, and we'd set up and pull down and set up and pull down and oh. wait for people to come, and then you know see if they're coming. And and I think. Um, it was interesting because we did a big outreach and plan, but in our university, it's probably a bit like this corner. I think there was four churches wow. just launched in that type of thing. So we would do all the groundwork, and I'm sure that everybody went to some other church because they were coming to us. Um, but we grew over the next probably um, three or four years, and we had about 40 or 50 people. And in, in terms of the, the denomination we were with, that that's really good and yeah. it was a healthy way a bunch of young families. and you were discipling people it wasn't just sunday people you were yeah. actually spending time with these guys yeah well i that's that's all we had you know yeah. so you you needed to disciple people because you needed you needed practically for the sure. church to run so there's you know there's no there's no room for spectators you can't got hide you can't do anything no. you need somebody pushing the button somebody playing the drums looking yeah. after the kids so yeah it was it was a it was a really I'd say it was a hard time, but it was an enjoyable time as well. And I often say when you start these journeys, one of the greatest gifts that God gives you is the, this beautiful gift of ignorance. Yeah. You don't know what you don't it's know. So it's just like, would I do it again? Probably not. But At that was time. I happy to do it? Awesome. Yeah, let's let's just get into it. So we, we did that for four years. Mm-hmm. Um and then after about four years, I, I just felt something shifting in, in my spirit. And it was really kind of, I think, growing up in, in that denomination and, and seeing the world very, very black and white. So dad was part of Potter's House as well? Or not? Yeah, dad was part of Potter's House. Okay. So yeah, that was, that was the experience that yeah. I'd had all yeah. my life from three years of age. So that felt natural, natural. Yeah, that the, that was the, Christianity for you. That was Christianity, and and we knew that you know from a lot of external um, Christians that we were perceived as you know a, a bit on the cultish. The, end. Yeah, the the cutting edge and yeah. and hyper legalistic, but you know when it was you don't working. know anything else, it was working. It saved you. It saved yeah. your family. Uh, well, it, well, it's interesting when you say it was working. I, I think. I think you, working is relative. Yeah. And depending on who you ask. And, sure. You know, like if I ran down the, the road and I said, I, I'm a fast runner, you might go, yes, until you see Usain Bolt. That's Do right. you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's relative. And I think that's, for me, one of the things that I realised is is while it's it's good to say it's working, um, was there more? Uh, yeah, Did, it was limiting. It, it was limiting. That's what I. Uh, that's what I generally said, and that's what I yeah. said before. You know, I think they're great, but they're limiting. And so I, I had a revelation of, of God in that I, I realized more than anything, it's not that I, I don't like to use they were right, we were wrong, we were right, they were yes. wrong. I think the best way to put it is we're incomplete. Yeah. Are you willing to admit you're incomplete? Big question. Is the big question. Yeah. And I think that was the, the issue. It's like where like how do you get that awareness? I think God has to Under show the spirit. you. It. Yeah. Um because if you as soon as you say inc- it's incomplete, um you, you have either, to do something about it. You have to do something about it. And it's either increases fear or increases faith. And so for a lot of so people... So you've got to still question. You've got to... You've you, got to question. You, yeah, I, I and if you don't question, that's where the problems... That's when you fit in that mould. Yeah. And I think um, for me, I, I was happy most of my life with the with the safety of the black and whiteness. But all of a sudden when you yeah, come Yeah, it offers past, boundaries and it's safe. It's safe. It's safe. Safe for the family, safe for your children, safe for you. Yeah. But when you, you become a leader... And when you become a pastor, and now you have to enforce, enforce. <laughs> that's when all of a sudden the weight of it was like, I actually don't have a conviction about some of this stuff. I could live within those boundaries, but for me to enforce but, yeah, them. Yeah, and so I never, I, I just didn't have the confidence. Yeah. I didn't have the confidence to think, 
I, I'm going to come when people have, and so, you know, there was a couple, I'll use an example, a couple had a TV. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, you're not allowed to have a TV. If you're in ministry, yeah. you're not allowed to have a TV. And, and it, it's funny because I, I think how legalism often works, it, it works in the nuances of language. So it's not that having a TV was sinful. No. But the first thing that you did when you backslid was got a TV. It's a, it was a form of rebellion. It yeah, was a, and so it's, it's the passive-aggressive yeah. way of, you know, condemning a behavior without saying, hey, we're not condemning it. So it's like we're washing our hands clean. So, But if it sits badly on you or if it sits on you, hey, that's your call, but we'll just make your world smaller. And so I remember having this conversation with somebody that, you know, in the process of discipleship, we're like, all right, we'd love for you to lead a small group. But one of the things that we're going to have to talk about is switch off or get rid eliminate. Of it. Yeah, and they're like, "But we don't feel it's an issue. We don't watch it that much." And then you know, I went, "But you, ha- you like part of me is just like, I'm but just you telling have to. you, this is the thing now." And and then I was like, "But I'm the pastor. Yeah, you have to do what I tell you." And I remember that conversation and going, "I don't think that cuts it." I don't, I don't think I can come up with any theological backing backing for it. I can I can make you know, it. stretch some bows and you know come up with something that might sound. But I've actually got a scripture, but I won't say it on camera because then people will use it. <laughs> I'll show it to you afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think it's one of those things that you go, wait a minute, you know, drinking's another thing, um, and there's all these these things that are. You could say they're not wise. Yeah. Um, or there's a better way. Yeah. But when you're trying to enforce a stand As a law. As a law on it, um, I just never felt comfortable. And so I, I started questioning in my own spirit and saying, all right, God, why, why do I have an issue? And I think the, the turning point for me was 1 Corinthians 8. You know, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church and he starts talking about the food offered to idols. Yeah. And he starts to talk about, you know, the different factions in the church. Yeah. You know, the ones that won't eat the food because of the the perception that it has. Yeah. Well, if they, we eat the food, it looks like we're backsliding or it looks like we're partaking. And then there's others that won't eat the food because of the, the supernatural power that might be transferred the through the food. And, and, um, and then there was the people that just ate the food. And nothing happened. To them. And nothing happened. And and then Paul goes, it's the mature ones that eat the food. Mm. And I was like, what? I, I, I thought the... It's rules the other way around. Were the, I thought the mature ones would be no. And of course, Paul qualifies it, goes, but if you know me exercising my freedoms would cause a brother to stumble, then hey, I'll back take up. my freedoms. Yeah. I'd rather keep... Yeah. And I realized most of our rules and regulations was to keep people fearful and immature. Mm. Don't get a TV because if you get a TV, You'll what might tempted. come into your lounge? Or what? And it's like, okay, and we're going to make the choices for you. And it's, it's exactly how I parent. You know, when, when my kids were five and six, I'll make all the decisions. I'll tell you what to eat. I'll tell you when to go to bed. But if I'm doing that for my 18-year-old and 23-year-old, there's an issue. Yeah. And so what I realized is there were some behavioral things that, while they weren't bad, they were incomplete. Correct. And they were providing a platform to keep people fearful and immature. And I realized I just didn't want to be that pastor. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to be fearful and I didn't want to be immature. Yeah. I wanted the ability to to be able to journey some of these things out sure. without the fear of guilt and um yeah guilt and and sin. also i chose at that time to to leave uh and and resign my position as a pastor because i also understand that if i if i'm part of the potter's house i'm part of that denomination yeah my my choices to do things that don't align, yeah, um, are, 
uh, are really not there. Hmm. Because I think ultimately when, when you're part of something, yeah. um, your choice to become part of it, God's, God, I think God cares more about unity than you going on your own journey. Of course. So for me, it was like, I don't, I don't want to be somebody that causes issues in that movement yeah. by going on my own journey. So my job is to remove myself from it. Yeah, you couldn't so honor the, the I couldn't call. Honor. You couldn't honor the people. You couldn't honor the movement. And I didn't. I didn't want to cause issues. And I, I think people have asked me about that. And I said, uh, and to this day, it's it's a deeply personal journey. Yeah. That I went on, and even people that I know and my brother's still part of that movement. Um, you know, I celebrate him, talk to him about church all the time. But what I don't do is I don't share my journey with him. No. Because God did something in me. God awoken yeah. something in me. Um, and It's a new reality. It's a new reality. And so what I had to do was make choices. Um, I chose, now in the process of me choosing the church group that I was, that, that I, the church that I was leading and the elders there, then um, got together and chose to follow me uh -huh. and so we end up starting our own little independent church for a while before we end up um becoming part of influences but i think i i was i was very very aware of the responsibility that i yeah. had um in leading people in yeah. that more than any time before mainly because i'd seen a lot of people do it really poorly yeah so even in that process where I started to really go through and question some of the deep convictions that I had, I I didn't change my behaviour. I didn't go and buy a TV the next week. I didn't yeah. start drinking. I didn't do... Yeah. No, no knee-jerk reactions. Yeah, I didn't because I I think for a few things, it, I wanted my word to still carry weight. Sure. If I changed my mind, I, you know, for one it's thing... Like it's like you were never that person yeah. anyway. You'd never, so, you never... You just wanted to escape. It's like a teenager. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I really thought, God, you got to help me. You got to help me navigate this. And I feel that that season um, was one of the most beautiful seasons of God revealing His grace to me. I never understood grace. Yeah. I never understood that Jesus just didn't die for my sins of the past, but He died for them in the future. That I, that the idea of losing my salvation by an action. Um, wasn't what God intended with the cross. It, no. it wasn't this temperamental thing that anything at any time by switching on the TV at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what I had. And, and I think for me it was this, it was learning to breathe. It was learning that God was this beautiful, good and kind and loved me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really like learning God as the Father aspect of him i knew him as god as a lord and master yeah but there was a facet of him and that's why i think that the understanding or incompleteness in any of our theologies or any of our perceptions of who god is is essential to looking at him to learn yeah or else we're just trying to reaffirm what we already know which i think is a really dangerous place for us to yeah. be you know it's interesting because we had similar journeys mm. You know, I was in the Romanian Pentecostal church, grew up in that church, I loved it. I was fully immersed in it, you know, every night of the week, seven days a week, mm -hmm. I was there. Monday night, I was leading the children's uh, orchestra, so I was conducting. Tuesdays, I was leading the youth. Wednesdays, we had service. Thursday, we had brass, so I played the trumpet in the mm -hmm. brass. Friday, we had choir. Saturday, we had outings. Sunday, two services. It was yeah. every day. I would fast once or twice a week. Yeah. I would be there every night, fully committed. I would donate maybe 20 to 30% of my income to missions and mm. ministry and church. And um, this went on for almost 20 years. Wow. You know, and uh, the reason why I left was very simple. I was frightened what I was, of what I was, was becoming. Mm. I just realized that I was like them. Mm. You know, I was growing into this, not me, yeah. monster. Yeah. You know, I could fake it. Yeah. You know? I, I think that's what most I mean, of us... I was doing that. it naturally, but yeah. it wasn't real. It yeah. wasn't me. You know, yeah, there was no harm. I, I could tick the boxes, no problem. Easy. 
I think for me... Um, That's why I left. Yeah. And I never looked back. A lot of people say, you'd be back, you'd be back. Yeah. I said, you know, you know, all I need to do is go there once mm. and I'm, you know, for five years I'm, I'm done, mm. you know. But I love the people and I yeah. love everything that goes on in yeah. there as, you know, as a community. I love the community and I'm still yeah. connected with the community. But once again, you know, when I realize, you know, what is working behind, even though the Lord is working, the yeah. church of people are saved and being delivered, there's also this overwhelming um, holdback mm. that holds people yeah. in a um, in a bondage, yeah. uh, which is even though it may, may seem spiritual, yeah. it's still they have they have no freedom. No, they don't know their identity. Yeah. They they know it maybe from the book a little bit, yeah. but it hasn't sunk in. Yeah. They don't fully experience the fullness of the spirit, you know, with all the gifts and mm -hmm. just the freedom, the freedom of grace, the freedom of power, the freedom of anointing, the freedom of ministry. Uh, some touch it every now and then, you know, yeah. as a as a seasonal or once, yeah. or I'll pray for somebody once, but it's not a way of life. Yeah, yeah I, I remember thinking about you know, my, my parents had a, an incredible um, encounter with God when they got saved. And they were, they were two very broken people. Um, mm -hmm. And God changed them, like, overnight. No drugs, no alcohol, you know, burned their TVs, got their, their, their records, smashed them. And, awesome. And just had, you know, and it was, it was a movement of God. It yep. was... It was, you know, the Jesus people movement. There was a sanctification movement that just swept through. And, and my parents were byproducts of that. And to this day, when, when they talk about it, it's like it happened yesterday. It's so, you still get so goosebumps. real to them. Yeah. Um, but as the time went by, I, I remember as I, as I was in that church, that, that happened probably early 80s. And, you know, it moved and, and that denomination and many others just had amazing revival through the yeah. 80s. and and 90s and then I feel like something began to shift and I remember watching it and thinking what's what's going on here and as I as I began to pass to myself I realized um for my parents when God showed up there was this amazing encounter and they 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 did something as a response to it they 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 got rid of things that they felt represented their old life. Mm. So they got rid of their drugs and their alcohol. They yep. got rid of their music and their yep. TVs. They stopped yep. going to cinemas and listening to FM radios. Some of them quit jobs. Some of them changed jobs. Some of them cut off friendships. And then comes my generation. <laughs> and instead of transferring what happened, they, they did something really subtle. They, they said... When God showed up, what we did is we did X and we did yeah. Y. We got rid of this and we did that and we started this. So for you to get God to show up, you you've to got this. to do this. And what was lost was you did it as a response to God. You You're trying to, to get it. me to do it to manipulate God. To get God on my side. So so it's rather than being led, we're trying to lead. And it's the dryness of it. Yeah. And so I remember we we did we had all the form but no power, mm. and so you you'd see and I see ultimately I think so many denominations and movements of God lose it in that transition. Yeah. And what happens is the older patriarchs in those movements um, feel like power is getting slipped. They become more and more legalistic to put you know the same songs in the same style and the same things and you see it in. Different church, and I, I see it really in in ethnic based churches. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like when God the showed form. up, we did this. We yeah. had the power. We had it the only works in that form. And yet, for the next generation, they're it like, means this nothing. is dead. Yeah. And so, what what is replaced? What what replaces Holy Ghost power is nostalgia. Yeah. And so you have songs that we sung, like if, if you go to some of these movements, they're singing the same songs that, that we sang in the 80s yeah, and preaching the same messages that we preached in the 90s. Oh, yes. And uh, that, 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 I remember these two single sermons 
and yeah. wear, and dressing the same. You go there, and it's could this, you ever could you ever do that that uh, victory sermon kind of talk? You know, no, no, and uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, blessed, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that, no. that came from America. Yeah, it was a very. I mean, I remember growing up, and you know, some of the blokiest Aussies that you've ever seen. And that, hey, can you burn it? Can you close off in for farther guard? And you're like, mate. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I think for me, it was, I just want God. Yeah. And if if God asks me to give up something, I, man, it's not yeah. an issue. And now as a father and as a pastor and as a leader, my my heart's desire is let's get rid of stumbling blocks. Yes. Let's, let's make it real. Let's make it real. And if it's not real... Yeah. Change everything or change nothing, whatever it is. Yeah. Let's make let's make the goal Jesus. Yeah. Let's talk about who he is. He says if we lift him up, he'll draw yeah. men unto himself. And I find so many places are now talking about their movement yeah. more than Jesus. Yeah. Their movement is saving yeah. me. They're, I'm so glad for this. I'm so it's like, oh, let's just talk about Jesus. Yeah. Let's let's be enamored with who he is. Let's let's discover. Just, you know, that, that pre- preached a message last Sunday um, and it was simply entitled, Jesus is way better than you think. That's right. And and it is. Like, the more you the more you know, the more you should realise you don't know. That's Not right. the more you know, the more it confirms what we already knew. No, you're right. It drives you. It draws you nearer. Mm. So um, you moved back to Perth. Yeah. And that's when you joined Kingdom City or you had another journey with... Yeah, so I, I went from... Um, I, I went from the... Influencers? Inf- I went to Influencers. I was there for about six years. Oh, you worked with them? Yeah, so I was, I was on staff there. And that's that's a charismatic church? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of breed. the founding Pentecostal churches in the nation. So you were totally free there. You had a new level of uh, Yeah, freedom. I think with any... With, like it were was, you filled with the Holy Ghost uh, in, in the in the Potter's house? Probably? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Were you operating in the spirit or not so much? To a, to a limited sense. Or not much? sense. Um, I, I wouldn't say prophetic. I think one of the one of the 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 things with with certain denominations is that they create a patriarchal system with giftings. It's like, okay. oh, you must be this person. It's special. It's reserved. So it's, they created. Yeah, uh, uh, almost a job description or a level they had exactly. to attain before you, and, could, um, you could uh, say, "Thus says the Lord." That that and exactly, and that was always "Thus says the Lord." And of course, yeah. you, and I, you had to be over fifty to do that. Yeah, you, you sure. had to have grey hair, bald hair, a moustache. Yeah. You know, like every now and then, a, a lady would <gasps> do it, and it would be. But she had a head cover. Or she? No, we didn't have the head covers, but oh, it was it out. was it was definitely a. I don't know if you should be doing that. Do you know what I mean? We, and, and there were just the nuances and the, the kind of, or probably the passive aggressive kind of, we just won't comment on it. We'll just let it slide. Um, but I just never felt confident. I, I You know, there was times where, I, oh, that's it, the, God, I don't, I, don't, I, don't feel, I don't feel the confidence to say, thus saith the Lord. My voice definitely wasn't deep enough and I didn't have a moustache. Um but as I as I came out, I think influences was was great at teaching yeah. about the gifts, mm-hmm. um, and there were some great pastors, Pastor Ashley Evans, Brad Bonhomme, um, uh, Greg Johnson, people, and I went to college there as well, and and just had an, a little bit more of an understanding. So it was it the same as Paradise Church kind of? Thing? Yeah, Paradise became influences when I was oh, okay. there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so same so, church, sorry. Just, just a name change. Yeah. yeah, so I was familiar with Paradise, Okay. but not so much. So yeah, so I think Paradise got changed to influences. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Okay, all right. Um, so it's the same, Ashley yeah. Evans just changed the name. That's okay. it. Um, and a lot of it was Paradise was the suburb that it was yeah. in. So as it grew to multiple campuses and Paradise. Oh, it fitted anyway. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I, most people just assume that it it's was like the name. It's like Churchlands for yeah, us, yeah. you know. Exactly. That's what I passed it. So it was yeah. just a beautiful name. It's just a great name. So I, um, I, I learn a lot there. I learn, I, I think um, we... The, the, the denomination that we had was very isolated. Yeah, and the way I that it isolated was making everybody else 
um, either lukewarm at best, hypocrites at worst, um, and presented them. The reason why their churches are growing is because they're diluting the scripture. They're not preaching the yeah. full truth, which made us, you know, as, as small, you know, and you had many scriptures to back it up. Wide is the road, narrow, and, you know, uh, we're the remnant and all this kind of language. And, and so going there, all of a sudden I realized, man, these people are passionate about souls. Yeah. They just want to see souls saved and and particular and his was yeah was so passionate and and we would do everything for that five ten minutes at the end of every service to go hey this is your chance and I would say particularly in Adelaide more people had their first encounter with Jesus at Paradise slash influences than any other church in I'm that sure. state and the thing is even people if they wanted to bring somebody to church for the first time they would take them there 100 percent. they knew that they will they there's knew. an altar call yes there's going to be an encounter yes and most likely they will respond yep and it's all and it was presented in a way that was contemporary so yep. it was it was it was a friendly way to experience god yep. um and so I, I learned a lot and was there for about um six years and then just felt god shift and journeyed that with pastor ashley and ultimately, I got a phone call from the ACC, Australian Christian Churches, over here to run Youth Alive. Mm-hmm. So I moved into WA to run Youth Alive. Was uh, Paradise part of ACC? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, the the Evans family uh, were, they ran, they were superintendent or oh, national for ACC president. Oh, for South Australia. For, for, uh, for national. Oh, okay. Um, so a- Andrew Evans was the national president before Brian Houston. So it was, it was part of their DNA. So I moved over here and um, ran Youth Alive um, and just started going to Kingdom City as my local church. Awesome. So I did that seven, eight years ago now. Wow. Are you still with Youth Alive? No. I, I When I started on staff at Kingdom City, I handed it over to a great man called John Ness. Wonderful. Well done. Mm. And now you're a campus pastor or a, you know, you, you've you Yeah, I, I do a bit of roaming now. So um, we've got five campuses now yeah. across Kingdom City. So on, That's just in Perth. Yeah, just in Perth. Um, I think there's, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, about 24 campuses worldwide from yeah. London to Dubai. I've been to Dubai. Oh, have you? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah Jai and Daniel, great pastors there. Wonderful. Botswana, Cambodia. Um and over COVID, crazy things have happened where we've started our online church and be, and through that, um, we've now got a campus in Johannesburg and, and Mexico, uh, Delhi in India. Wonderful. Um, so th- it's funny because um, our part, senior leader, Pastor Mark, hasn't been to any of these countries yeah. and yet there's thriving churches that have started. Uh, so, so my role on Sundays is to travel around and support the campuses, yeah. preaching, leading, yeah. emceeing. And during the week, I help um, connect our business leaders, our men, um, and also create um, bridges with outside community um, yeah. and really start to uh, try to help equip people outside of our church about our church. Um, there's a lot of ignorance, as, as you would know, about particularly Pentecostal churches um, yeah. in the greater community and um, trying to start to bridge some of those gaps. I think it's getting better. Yeah, I think it's very uh, well. You're probably aware. I mean, we have a North network here, a mm. geo network of pastors yeah. that we meet on a regular basis. Um, there's a Sterling. Every there's a lot of networking yeah. going on around the city. A lot yeah. of prayer. So I think it's getting much much better. Now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I know ACC on their own have their own networks as well. Yeah, there's about but, eighty churches in. But a lot the of way. the other smaller churches or smaller yeah. denominations and independent churches. They, they now they network more yeah. than before, which is great. Yeah, I mean, you have the luxury of having so many people that you can count on. So yeah. basically, you don't even need to go yeah. outside. Yeah, and that is one of the beautiful things about being part of a, of a great team is we do have that connection. But yeah. I also love hearing journeys and stories and catching up with people outside. Yeah. And your greenhouse uh, platform is wonderful. And, yeah. you know... The body gets so much, you know, and the fact that you guys release a lot of content mm-hmm. in the podcasts and the video casts, and also what you've done for the city with the conferences, yeah, uh, at the uh, convention center, what you guys have done at the showgrounds. I mean, a lot of people have no idea. Like, you know, I've organized, you know, big events throughout the world for over 25 years, yeah. 
And I know what it takes to organize these and just to get the favor to yeah. be able to be present there. Yeah. I mean, I, I rejoiced. I went with my wife. I said, no, I want to go to a show when Kingdom City is there yeah. because we want to spend the night there yeah. and just, you know, enjoy the yeah. presence of God. And it was beautiful. And just to see Muslims and Hindus dancing sure. with their kids and, you know, around carols. Phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. phenomenal. God's been so kind. And also in the city, what you guys have done, you know, with the concerts and... Phenomenal, mm. phenomenal. You have to be almost blind not to see what God is doing in the city. Yeah, I think. And that, with the voice as well, and you know the panels now yeah. next month again, mm. uh, you know where where your leaders are opening up to the wider body yeah. to answer questions and being vulnerable, mm. and Jemima as well. And I think it's phenomenal. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, no, you guys are doing a great job. We don't look up to you as we have to be there. No, we cheer you on. Thank Just you. know that. We want to have a strong church in the city. We need strong churches. Yeah. And you need little churches in the suburb, yeah. in the suburbs as well. For sure. Uh, and I love ACC is planning another church in... Um, Warwick. Warwick, mm. yeah. The Disciple Church. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I saw that as well. I'm, you know, it's only like 10 k's from where I am or 7 k's from where we are in Olamara now. Uh, Phenomenal. I think there should be a church in every suburb. I said to somebody, every every primary school and every high school should be a church. Yeah. You know, around that community. Yeah. So there's so much work to be done in the mm. city. And it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, now, you have three sons. Three sons. Phenomenal. Yeah. 23, 18, and 13. Wow. So, yeah, it's a fun household. I, I love having sons. I don't know what I'd do with, with daughters, but... There's always some basketball I've got one game. son and three girls. Oh, really? Three daughters, so. Yeah. And he's upset. Oh, is he? He wants. He wants. He wants, a, he wants another. How old are yours? Um, seven, five, and three, and baby. Okay. Oh, just wow. Had a baby. Yeah. Congratulations. I'm probably older than you, and I have a baby. <laughs> I, I'm glad. I'm glad I passed the baby season. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, he he cried when he found out that yeah, the last no, one was going to be a girl. We couldn't console him it was oh. just comfort him you know it was difficult yeah. <laughs> but it is beautiful yeah. what's the legacy what, what would you like to leave your kids and uh, you know grandkids I think I think for them to have an understanding I think one of the things that I've been really pondering on lately is what does it mean to have a real relationship with God that lasts into your 70s, 80s, 90s for the rest of your life? And of course, for, for us that grew up in different seasons of church and different seasons, um, my heart breaks for all those people that we used to do church with. And they dropped out. Started so well, so passionate, so driven. Um, and... I see them either indifferent at best to God, resentful at worst. And I think, what, why? What, what? What's missing? What was, what was missing? Yeah, what was, the, what was the thing that caused them to walk away and not come back? And I think that, that it's one thing to walk away from organised religion or a church. Yeah. Absolutely. But the the problem that we have is church, organized religion and God for most of these people are so intrinsically connected. And what that makes for me really realize and the weight of is how do I present God? What what's my God filter to these people that are listening? Yeah. Is it God wants more from you? God's demands. Do I do I do I put the put do I put the weight of their relationship with God on them? Do they walk away feeling tired from their relationship with God? Do do they walk away feeling released if they walk away from church? Cause I, I think it, it's one thing when we talk about discipleship, um, to put the weight on us. Yeah. You know, you, you the disciplines. Yeah. But the disciplines without the passion are dry. And I've seen the byproduct of that. And so I think about the legacy that I want to leave behind, whether it's in my family, 
or with people at church. Um, and, I, and it's simple. I, I want people to know God's good. Mm-hmm. It, it, God, goodness is who he is. Yeah. Kindness is what he does. Yeah. And I think people know that God's good, but often they don't feel or experience his kindness. Sure. And if you don't get people to see that, or, or often, I think, no, I'll rephrase that. We all experience his kindness, but we don't often credit him for it. Yes. So it's a bit like... You Entitlement, know, in a sense. It's a bit like a teenager. You know, you parents never do anything for me. Yeah. And as parents, you could go, sit down. I'll give you a, a list. But it, I feel like our job is, as pastors should be, let's, let's talk about that connection. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love that when when Moses says to God, "Show me your glory on on Mount Sinai," yeah, and and God's response is, "I'll stay there. I'll let my goodness pass by you." Yeah, and I feel like that's that's a picture of God. It's like God, show me how amazing you are, and He's like, yeah, "I'll show you how good I am." Yeah, and I feel like if we can impart that, even when people walk away from God. Or walk away from organized religion, there'll be this, oh, God's so good. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be silly not to go back. Yeah. You know, because it's that, it's that prodigal son. What, what does he remember? He remembers that his dad was good. Yeah. And it drew him back into a relationship. I, I feel like there's so many of our contemporaries that think about God and they think about the rules and regulations. They think about all the things they can't do and they go, I don't know if I want to go back to that. Yeah. And you see them and you talk to them and you encourage them to come to church and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't. Sunday's my only day off or Sunday. I don't, you know. And I'm like, oh, but it's not about that. It's about... It's about you experiencing God's goodness again. Yeah. Do, do, do you remember that? And so many of them are like, no, I don't remember it. So I just, I, I think about my sons and I go, I, I want them to walk out and go, wow, I, I've forgotten how good God is. Yeah. Or, oh, man, remember how good God is. And I, yeah. I think that's the, that's the Job and God conversation that he has in, you know, Job 36, 7 and 8. And it's that, you know, and you appreciate this. Growing up, you see Job and God having this intense conversation. You know, Job, Job keeps a great attitude for so long. And that yeah. was me. And, and so it's like, I did this. And, and, I, and finally he cracks and yeah. goes, God, it's not fair. Really what he's doing is trying to go, God, come down to my level so I can understand you. Yeah. And Job, God says to Job, who is this who darkens my counsel without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will ask you a few things. Wow. And I, I've always had this, you know, this this harsh father figure, pastor going, who are you to question me? Just do what you're told. You know, it's not for you to know the mysteries. It's for you to just, just be obedient and then, of course, you realize, like, God's good. Why, he wouldn't, God's, God's not into patronizing and belittling people. So yeah. what would he be doing? I realized what he was doing was something so beautiful. It's Job, who is this that asks questions without knowledge and understanding? And then, he's, then he takes him outside and he says, see the stars? See how they stay there? You don't have to worry about that, do you? <laughs> see how the wind flies through the air? You don't even know where it comes from. And it works all by itself. There's this beautiful passage. It says, see the hawk? Does it fly by your wisdom? Yeah. Can and you what, follow it? Yeah. It like It's just like for a chapter and a half, it's God not belittling him, awakening Job yeah. to realize, man, I don't know. I know nothing and it happens. Yeah. I don't worry about any of this. Yeah. And it just works. Yeah. And what God was doing was going, Job, you can either know everything or trust me on everything. That's you right. can't have both. both. And of course, Job's response, my favorite passage, it says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Yeah. And I think that's 
That's what I want to leave with people, the, the wow of God, not the why. Yeah. The why is like, why God? Joke. God, come down to my level. By the end, Job's like, oh, God, I just look up to you. <laughs> and I think if we can do that, so people walk away just going, in the midst of the craziest season, yeah. you know, we deal with people struggling with, with cancers and families breaking apart. And in the midst of that, if they can look up to the stars, go down to the ocean and go, I, the ocean's come here and no further. I didn't have to worry about that last night. That's right. God, wow, you're so kind. Yeah. I think if we could do that, I think discipleship, discipline, would just be a byproduct of going, man, I, I just, I love God. Yeah. That's what, that's what I want to, that's what I want to be part of. He's yeah. just, in a way, like, John the Baptist, I must decrease and he must e- increase. Mm. If, at the end of the day, we just, Leave every surface service going. I didn't know that about Jesus. Did yeah. you? How good is he? Wow. Yeah, that, man, that's beautiful. That's... Thank you so much for you know going deep with this because yeah. this is beautiful. Thanks for coming on the show. I'm sure we'd have so much to chat about. Mm-hmm. Really value what you shared with us and your life story and just the way you opened up and uh, just the way you talk about God, man. This is really precious. Thank you. So good. What a beautiful story, eh? And uh, you probably realized how his face just lit up as he shared the goodness of God. My prayer is that you really experience this goodness of God and uh, you empower those around you to also step in faith and just see God for who he is and just be marveled at his beauty. And I'm sure this content is valuable to you. And if that is the case, we'd love it if you could share it with other people so others can be blessed by this and benefit from this. And if you have anyone that you think should be at Kingdom Stories from Down Under, uh, just um, send me a, a text or a comment and let me know, especially for people here in Perth, Western Australia, because this is the people that we want to profile. We thank you for journeying with us. Share this content. Subscribe to our channel, both on YouTube, podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you consume this content. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Kingdom Stories from Down Under. We'd love it if you would subscribe, rate, and share these stories with your wider community. And remember, every story is worth sharing, including yours.